Thank you everyone for joining us for this year's ANU Japan Update Conference. My name is Shiro Armstrong. I'm the director of the Australia Japan Research Center here at the Crawford School of Public Policy in the ANU's College of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, the Japan Update is convened with the ANU Japan Institute and my colleagues Lauren Richardson and Ippei Fujiwara. As we commence, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the ANU campus in Canberra on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal people and recognise that many of you are joining us from across Australia. I want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands each of us meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. This year, we're joining you online across three days instead of our one day symposium in Canberra. It's a pity, of course, that we can't meet in person with many of our regular audience uh, and have our expert colleagues from Japan join us in Canberra, but this is an opportunity to reach an audience beyond Canberra. Um, we'll be recording the update, uh, all of it, and we'll make those recordings available soon and let everybody who registered know about those recordings. Each year with the Japan update, we have sessions on the economy, politics and foreign policy, and society. This year we'll kick off with a panel on Japan's handling of the coronavirus pandemic, including the health response and the politics. The big news, of course, is the resignation of Prime Minister Abe Shinzo, and that's a topic that will be discussed on some of the panels. Prime Minister Abe brought political stability to Japan after a revolving door of Prime Ministers. So including his time as Prime Minister for one year in 2000, 2006, he overlapped with all of Australia's six Prime Ministers since John Howard. Much is being written on Abe's legacy. Uh, his resignation may have received a mixed response domestically in Japan, but internationally the response has been a significant outpouring of praise. And that's because it's in diplomacy that Abe shone. Under his leadership, Japan was able to conclude the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Economic Agreement, and those connected domestic reform to trade policy for the first time. Later, Japan concluded an economic partnership with the European Union, and importantly, took a leadership role in, in concluding the CPTPP, the Comprehensive Progressive um, Agreement towards the TPP, after the United States withdrew. Prime Minister Abe built a close personal relationship with President Trump and handled him as well as any international leader. Managing the economic, political and security relationship with the Trump administration is not for the faint-hearted and Abe managed to secure Japan's interests. Japan also repaired and improved the China relationship under Prime Minister Abe. President Xi Jinping and Abe came to power only months apart with the bilateral relationship at a low point. Gradual improvement in the China-Japan relationship saw Abe visit Beijing for a state visit in October 2018 and announced 50 joint infrastructure projects in third countries. President Xi was due to visit Japan for a state visit in April this year, but that's been postponed due to the pandemic. Japan, as many know, also concluded a successful G20 summit as president last year uh, and that was in the midst of a, a worsening China-US trade war. Under Abe, Japan has been a leader and defender of multilateralism as uncertainty has risen globally. The record isn't spotless though. Japan's important relationship with South Korea is at its lowest point since relations were normalized in 1965. They've not been able to escape history and Japan deployed highly politicized trade restrictions on South Korea. Those trade measures relate to the new economic security policies of export controls and restrictions on foreign investment in Japan that seem to place narrow security interests ahead of economic interests. That's of course in response to, much, to a much more complicated and uncertain external environment that Japan and many of our countries all face. So Abe's successor, successor has his work cut out for him. And yes, all the candidates for the next Prime Minister of Japan are men. Japan has made some progress in improving gender equity in recent times, but from a pretty low base. Female labour force participation has increased, but much of it in non-regular or insecure employment. And the gender wage gap remains really large. 
changes to how people have uh, how people people work have accelerated due to the coronavirus pandemic, and that could remove some of the barriers for women if Japan's able to take take advantage of some of those changes. Because the progress is urgent, not just for society, but because Japan continues to face huge demographic challenges. For Australia, Japan has become a closer political and security partner. What was a strong economic relationship and close people to people ties have strengthened and deepened. And under Abe, the political and security relationship has deepened. Australia and Japan are anchors of stability, security, and openness in our region as the United States and China continue to be sources of instability, both in their own right, but also as their strategic competition makes things much harder for all of us. How Australia and Japan work with others, including China and the United States, will determine our prosperity and security. So today, as we start the Japan update, we launched the latest version of the East Asia Forum quarterly publication on Japan's choices. That discusses some of the big choices for Japan. So a link has been sent to all of you who registered, should be in the chat function now, and we'll make sure that it's linked in the YouTube description. The update will cover more issues, of course, uh, many more issues, including how Japan is managing the economic shocks from the coronavirus pandemic. I want to thank our speakers for making the time to share their expertise with all of us. And I want to thank Marie Armstrong, no relation, and Naomi Oxenham for organizing the update for us and doing all the behind the scenes work and the excellent work they've done. So let me now hand over to Associate Professor Sanjaya Senanayaka from the ANU Medical School to chair the first panel and introduce the speakers. Sanjaya is an infectious disease specialist and has been providing much needed adult supervision on the global response to COVID-19 here in Australia. So over to you, Sanjaya. Thank you, Shiro, for that introduction and talk. I am privileged uh, to be chairing this session on Japan's choices beyond COVID-19. And we have uh, three excellent speakers who I, whom I'm sure are going to generate uh, a lot of discussion. We're going to leave questions. Please generate questions on this webinar as you normally do, but we'll try and answer them at the end of the three talks. So rather than after each talk, at the end of the third talk, we'll start to answer those questions and hopefully there'll be a lot to discuss. I think there will be. So we are now oh, good eight months or so, eight or nine months into this outbreak, almost six months since the pandemic was declared. We've got about 27 million confirmed cases worldwide in a geographically wide area, I think almost uh, every country in the world has experienced COVID now. We've got almost 900,000 deaths. And having said that, and despite the fact that COVID is in our minds, in our thoughts every day because of uh, the, the wide media exposure and just day-to-day -day conversations with everyone else, there is still a lot we are learning about this virus and how it behaves in different populations. And I think it is really important to see how different countries have responded to the challenges that COVID has posed to them. And today we're going to hear about Japan from a medical, uh, economic and political point of view. So Japan at the moment has about 72,000 confirmed cases for a population of about 126 million people. And there have been different waves or surges if you want to call it that. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. Haruka Sakamoto is an assistant professor at the Department of Health Policy and Management at uh, Keio University. She has working experience at the Department of International Cooperation, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare of Japan, where she was deeply involved in health policy activities in Japan. She is also currently working at the Gates Foundation Tokyo office and the World Health Organization as a consultant. Thank you.
you very much for your kind introduction. So my name is Haruka Sakamoto, Assistant Professor at the Department of Health Policy and Management at Keio University in Japan. Thank you very much for giving me such a great opportunity today. And it is my great pleasure to be here today to present Japan's COVID-19 strategy. I am an expert in the public health and then in my presentation slide, I mainly explain the current COVID-19 situation in Japan and then Japan's strategy for COVID-19 from a public health perspectives. So there are, this figure shows Japan's current situation. The left figure shows the daily number of a confirmed case, while the right shows the daily number of deaths due to the COVID-19. We experienced the first wave of the COVID-19 in early March to April, mainly caused by the returnee from European countries and the United States. And two to three weeks after the first wave, we experienced the increase in deaths due to the COVID-19 in mid to late April. Then the government announced the state of emergency on the 7th April, and we then succeed in decreasing in both COVID-19 case and the deaths. However, since early July, we have experienced the resurgence of the COVID-19. This resurgence is mainly because people restarted their daily activities and as seen in many other countries, younger generations are the main source of spreading infections. I will explain the details about the PCR testing policy in Japan later, but this resurgence is also due to the PCR testing's increase in capacity. So the government expanded its testing capacity compared with that in March and April, and thus we could capture more, more, more positive case compared with that in the first wave. The main difference between the first and the second wave is that this time in the second wave, we do not experience much death due to the COVID-19. The number of the case reported yesterday was 293 nationwide, and then assuming the second wave of infection is now converging. So here is a comparison of the number of the deaths per 100,000 people worldwide. As of September 6, Japan's death toll per 100,000 people was 10.73, a far lower figure than in Western countries, although some have pointed out that Japan may be high in the Asian countries. However, uh, considering the Japan's overwhelmingly high proportion of the older people, I think it can be said that Japan has been success successful in limiting the number of deaths compared to other Asian countries. The proportion of the elderly, those who are aged 65 years and the order is currently 28% currently in Japan, which is the highest in the world. In addition, the population density is very high in the metropolitan areas in Japan, such as Tokyo and then Osaka, which is also a disadvantage in terms of the COVID-19 measures. So they are considering these unfavorable conditions, such as population aging and then high density populations, it can be said that although the number of deaths per population is certainly higher than in other countries in Asia, but we have succeeded in keeping the number of deaths low on the whole. Uh, so the what works well in Japan, uh, the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced in July that the Japan model was the key to success for the COVID-19. There is no clear definition of the Japan model, but its main component is a cluster-based approach which I will explain later, and then no lockdown measures. So unlike other countries, Japan did not introduce a lockdown. Rather, the government encouraged people to stay home, avoid crowded areas, and then work remotely. These were the voluntary basis, and then there was a no legal penalty. However, according to the data, most people followed the government's request, and then during the epidemic period, the proportion of people going out were more than 80% lower than normal period, especially in the urban areas. Uh, here, uh, I'd like to explain about some cluster approach, which was the main approach about the Japan's COVID-19 strategy. The first, the importance is to know about the difference between the SARS and the COVID-19. 
So in such case, in, the 2000, in 2003, most of all infected became severely ill or had any symptoms, and then it was easy to detect infected. Also, the patient did not have infectivity before the symptom onset. That is why, by tracing the severely ill patient and their close contact, we could contain SARS. However, in the COVID-19 case, there is a larger proportion of asymptomatic or presymptomatic cases that transmit the virus, and then it is very difficult to detect and isolate all the patients. So this is the main difference between the COVID-19 and the previous pandemics. And then another characteristics of COVID-19 is that about 80% of infected does not further infect others. Instead, less of the 20% further infected others, and then among them, only a few causes in the several infected, so-called in a cluster. Uh, so in Japan, we did not emphasize sporadic case as they usually do not further infect others. Instead, we emphasize the super spreaders, which cause in the cluster. And so after the careful investigation of the clusters happened in Japan in early February, we identified the possible condition that the cluster happens. So clusters were found to be more likely to occur in closed space with poor ventilation, crowded place with many people nearby, and then close contact setting, such as in close range conversation. Therefore, avoiding these three C conditions has been a national slogan in Japan since the beginning to reduce cluster occurrence. And then next, I'd like to explain more details about Japan's strategy, namely testing, contact tracing, and the isolation policy. So about testing, the testing policy is rooted in the aforementioned cluster approach that is emphasizing the preventing clusters happening and does not care about the sporadic cases. So in Japan, initially, PCR testing was only conducted at the local public health centers and not conducted at clinics and hospitals. This is based on the 2009 novel influenza pandemic experience that many people rushed to hospitals seeking for testing, seeking for testing, and then cause nosocomial infections. So to avoid this situation and then protect healthcare professionals and then personal protective equipment, the government limited testing place only for the local public health centers. The government also encouraged the general public to stay at home at least four days unless they are old, have underlying conditions, and have a severe symptoms such as shortness of breath. Instead, the main focus was to capture those who are the part of the cluster and their close contact. The public greatly criticized this approach. First of all, it would not be easy to understand the cluster approach. So as was done in most countries, expanding the testing capacity is easy to understand and then it gives the impression that government is taking measures against infectious disease. On the other hand, Japanese approach of limiting the scope and then location of testing is not easy to understand and may be perceived as not taking any measures. Uh, of course, the uh, testing system, which focus on the clusters, also had its challenges. The primary reason is that Japan did not have sufficient PCR testing capacity to begin with, and then expansion of the testing system did not progress quickly enough. So as a result, it was sometimes impossible to test people who needed to be tested, for example, those who were part of the cluster or who had been in close contact with infected or those with a symptomatic condition, even if a physician judged that the test was necessary. Uh, besides, as mentioned earlier, local public health center in Japan conducted the testing, but initially, they had limited staff and were unable to respond quickly when there was a surge in patient. For example, it took time to establish a drive through testing system, as seen in some countries. So in the future, we need a system that enables rapid testing at healthcare facilities and clinics other than local healthcare centers. Uh, here's another point I'd like to make about the testing policy for the asymptomatic patient. 
So in some countries, large-scale testing for asymptomatic people is conducted, but large-scale testing for the asymptomatic patient is not recommended in Japan. This rule is because the number of people infected in Japan is assumed to be very small compared with the uh, Western countries. Thus, the prior probability is low in Japan, and then there is a the concern of the false negative results and then the cost effectiveness issues. On the other hand, in early July, for example, there were the signs of the spread of the infection in Tokyo areas, particularly among the younger people working in the nightclubs and pubs. And then so mass, tests, mass screening was carried out on this high risk population. While we do not test asymptomatic individual with the aim of containing the epicenter in those who seem to have a high pre-probability, we do not recommend testing the wider public. In the future, for example, I think there is a room for the further consideration of group testing, targeting at a high risk population and testing in places where the mortality rate increasingly significantly when cluster occurs, such as healthcare facilities and nursing homes. On the other hand, I think testing itself does not decrease the number of infected people. The suppression of the infection is only a matter of enforcing individual preventing measures and then preventing clusters from occurring. In Japan, as with the masks in the United States, the testing system has been a political issue, but I like to emphasize here that the testing system is just one part of the comprehensive measures against the infectious diseases. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, explain about the contact tracing policy. So the, unlike the countries in the Asian region, there was a strong concern over the privacy issues and then did not introduce any application gathering information about the infected and their close contact by the middle of June. Instead, the staff at the local public health centers asked the infected individually over the phone call when, met, who, at where. And then the public center did not disclose any information regarding the infected. However, as the number of infected people increase, there was a limit to public health center's ability to collect information by human resources alone. So the finally, Ministry of Health, Safe and Welfare developed and introduced an application named COPOA for collecting contact information. So the Bluetooth is used to detect and record contact between users of this application. It would notify users if he or she had close contact with COVID-19 positive. Users who are notified by the application will be able to voluntarily live in isolation or consider seeking medical attention on their own. Still, this application does not gather any personal information. Lastly, about an isolation policy, by the infectious control law in Japan, the infected has been hospitalized at an initial stage, which put a burden on healthcare facilities. So concerns were expressed about the mild or asymptomatic patient occupying a healthcare facility bed. The government then changed the policy that these mild and asymptomatic should be isolated in hotels or other isolation facilities rather than admit to the hospital, except for cases that were already seriously ill or those are at high risk of becoming seriously ill as an older people. Uh, in some areas, it was impossible to provide a sufficient number of facilities for the mild case, and they were forced to treat them at home. So they are considering the risk of home infection. It is desirable to isolate people, especially those living with high-risk individuals, in principle in hotels. So the, uh, here is the summary of the Japan's approach for the COVID-19. As mentioned many times, uh, in this presentation, the cluster approach has been the main focus in Japan. And then focused inspection were carried out on the people who made up the clusters and then their close contact to prevent to faster to the uh, faster cluster happening. And then we did not introduce a lockdown. Uh, rather, the uh, government encouraged people to change their behavior uh, in in to stay at home and work remotely. So next, uh, I'd like to explain about how Japanese healthcare system contributed to the COVID-19 control. So first, let me briefly explain about the, how, uh, about the Japanese healthcare system. 
So the, uh, in 1961, uh, although Japan was not a high income country at that time, we were able to establish a universal health insurance system. This system covers an entire population living in Japan and secure access to healthcare service at affordable cost. In order to ensure cost containment, Japan also introduced a uniform fee schedule alongside the establishment of the universal health insurance system. Like most of the European countries, the government of Japan determines the price of healthcare services, which are revised once every two years. This publicly defined fee applies to the private healthcare facilities and are not limited only to the public healthcare facilities. The uniform fee schedule enables us to contain the total cost of the healthcare, even though the majority of healthcare facilities in Japan are privately owned. So by combining the universal health insurance scheme and the uniform fee schedule, Japan has secured access to healthcare service for all people, regardless of their socioeconomic status, while at the same time, they're controlling the total healthcare expenditures. Uh, in addition to our universal health insurance system and the uniform fee schedule, public health centers have also played an essential role in improving population health in Japan in the history. So for example, tuberculosis was one of the leading cause of this in Japan during the post-war period. All costs related to the TB management, such as screening and treatment, are covered by public health financing through taxation with no out-of-pocket payment to the patient. While the public health centers have been in charge of the public health management of TB, including mass screening, healthcare facilities have also played an important role. So the individuals who have any symptoms that indicate the possibility of TB infection, such as fever or cough, can access healthcare facilities at affordable cost, thanks to the universal health insurance system. So by combining tax-based public financing and the universal insurance scheme, as well as in the public health centers and healthcare facilities, Japan was able to rapidly decrease the deaths by tuberculosis in the country. The effective combination of the policies and health infra infrastructure is also thought to be one of the main factors underlying the Japan's success so far in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic domestically. So during our initial response, are the public health centers play the central role in the COVID-19 management including the contact tracing and the public financing has covered all the costs for test and treatment. In addition, thanks to the Japan's healthcare system's universality and the no gatekeeping system, any person who had any symptom, whether it be fever or cough, had access to healthcare facilities without worrying about the cost, which resulted in the early detection, isolation and treatment of the COVID-19 patient. So we need to note the negative aspect of the no gatekeeping system in Japan. So because individuals can easily and affordably to go to healthcare facilities, there wasn't a concern that people would rush in mass to healthcare facilities seeking COVID-19 tests of out of fear. So the accordingly, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the government set the screening criteria to prevent the spread of the main spread of the infection within the public health centers. But again, Japan's healthcare system, such as universal health insurance system and the public health centers, together with the Japan's COVID-19 uh, approach, Japan's COVID-19 cluster-based approach, contribute to success in the COVID-19 outbreak in Japan so far. Okay, so the, uh, another key success factor is how we manage the aging population. As I mentioned, Japan is one of the oldest country in the world. So proportion of the elderly is almost 30 percent in Japan. And then the, as we already know that elderly is the highest risk for the COVID-19. So if the cluster occurs at nursing facilities, it poses severe burden on the local healthcare facilities. So how to prevent the cluster happening in the nursing home is the one of the, our main issues. So there's no official data is, is not coming yet, but compared to the uh, European countries, the number of the clusters happening in the nursing home and in the healthcare facilities is much lower here in Japan. And then I think which is one of the main successful factor of the uh, we can uh, decrease the number of the COVID deaths. 
While the RA, we also need to the uh, negative impact of the uh, social distancing among the older people during the COVID-19 pandemic. So now the older people are encouraged to stay at home and then do not uh, meet people or friends or do not do participate in any social activities. However, the compared with the older people, previous research shows that compared with the older people who meet their friend at least a month or month, those who do not have 1.3 to 1.4 times higher risk of dementia requiring long-term care. Or another research showed that compared with an older people doing a physical exercise alone, the elderly doing a physical exercise with a group have a lower risk of the falling. Or like the, uh, we, uh, it is the, uh, the COVID-19 may, uh, may last for the one or two more years. I think the, how we can treat an older people, not just an isolate them, but how we can manage their well-being is an, another concern here in Japan. Okay. So the, uh, this is the uh, new normal for the elderly. So the older people with a lack of social participation and then social isolation are at a higher risk of depression, this cognitive impairment, and then the uh, care needs and their care needs are predicted to be more severe. So going out, working, interacting with people, and then participating in a society is a significant opportunity to reduce the risk of force, hypertension, diabetes, and any other health conditions, including the care needs, and this among seniors, and to improve the health of the seniors throughout the community. So this through the use of the ICT, it is possible to reduce the risk of infection among the elderly while enabling them to participate in social activities. So of course, we need to protect them from the COVID-19, but at the same time, we also need to think about how to secure their well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, thank you very much. This is the end of my slide. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sakamoto-san, for a, a very lovely talk. It covered uh, many aspects of the outbreak in Japan. And I wrote down lots of questions, which uh, we can talk about. And we've already had five or six questions from the uh, listeners as well. So now we will move on to our second speaker. So uh, Hiromi Murakami is a visiting scholar at Global Health Innovation Policy Program at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS. Prior to joining GRIPS, oops, excuse me, I've just had a technical difficulty here. Uh, sorry, there we go. Prior to joining GRIPS, she was involved in various projects in US Japanese institutions, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Health and Policy Institute, and Economic Strategy Institute. Her expertise includes state industrial relations and global health policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will be starting my slides first. Okay, um, thank you very much for kind invitation to speak at this ANU Japan Update series. I'm very honored to be here. And just before starting, uh, this is solely my own view and I'm not representing groups or any other institutions. So let me share my view uh, why Mr. Abe's approval rating had been low, so low, and how the government measures have been uh, perceived in the eyes of Japanese citizens. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to show this uh, um, graph that uh, Japanese people are very concerned of COVID-19. And uh, if you see it, uh, 40, 87% uh, 80, of people are concerned, have anxiety that either himself or his family member might get infected. So very conscious about the, the situation in COVID-19. And having said that, um, here's uh, the, the approval rate uh, of our administration's response to COVID-19. Uh, majority, 60% uh, disapprove of his, of his uh, response to COVID-19. If you look at the breakdown, um, of course, LDP supporter would uh, approve, but if you look at the other party supporters and non-partisans, uh, they're consist of 
uh, around 60%, they are mostly not, appro not approving Ab Abe administration's responses to COVID-19. And I know Australian Prime Minister, Mr. Scott Morrison, has been uh, enjoying a high approval rating because of his response to the pandemic. Uh, in time of crisis, usually it should be a great opportunity for uh, leaders, political leaders, to show his or her uh, political leadership, strong leadership. And not only Mr. Morrison, but uh, Mrs. Uh, Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, or Mrs. Merkel of Germany, you know, but also many other democratic democratic leaders in the world, the approval rating have been soared uh, during this uh, pandemic era. However, there are only few leaders whose rating have been substantially dropped, uh, namely Mr. Trump and Mr. Johnson and Mr. Bolsonaro of Brazil and Mr. Abe. Uh, Mr. Abe's is, uh, point is not here. Um, but uh, he's uh, definitely in the, this group of red group. So if you look at the Mr. Abe's approval rating, uh, it has been declining, but some, uh, because, you know, um, Shirosa mentioned in the very beginning that, you know, Abe's uh, just, you know, announced um, uh, resigning from his prime ministership. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, the, his approval rating suddenly jumped, jumped 20 points. Um, so it's quite interesting phenomena that, that maybe, I don't know, um, I have to ask other panelists what they think of it, but it's interesting to see that the quite jumping of approval rate at the end of his era after announcing a, a designation. So what do... Um, people expect from leaders in time of crisis? Is it bold leadership or decisiveness or proactive measures or continuous effort to tackle issues? Or maybe honesty, um, because I remember um, governor, New York governor, Mr. Cuomo, he had broadcasted, you know, almost every day about telling us, you know, this is situation today and this is what we have done and this is what we're shortcoming of, and then this is what we need, help us. You know, it was so direct, the message that you get from those leaders, and then you almost feel like, you know, there's anything I can do. You know, so I can get the sense of trustworthy of leader, leadership. Um, unfortunately, uh, in case of Prime Minister Abe, uh, it, uh, he didn't deliver them effectively. Unlike, you know, the older reputation overseas, but domestic reputation is not as much as high as overseas. So, you know, for many of you, Japan seemed handling the crisis very well and combating disease wisely. And because of the relatively low number of uh, reported cases and death, uh, but the truth is that Abe administration has fumbled the ball. Um, for many of our Japanese fellows' eyes, uh, Japanese leadership have been mostly indecisive, reactive, and invisible. Um, let me explain. Um, first point, uh, indecisiveness. Um, I'm, I'll be uh, making comment about looking at timeline here. Um, during February and March, uh, Mr. Abe was trying to move forward with hosting the Tokyo Olympic Games, which viewed as his important part of his legacy. And so as uh, Mr. Xi Jinping's visit to Tokyo, they are supposed to have a meeting. Uh, by then, it was increasingly unlikely that Tokyo Olympic Games will, be, will not be held, right? Unlikely that it will not be held in, in the summer. But the decision comes, came very late, which is in March 24. Until the decision is made, there were awkward period existed. One hand, schools are asked to close. On the other hand, TVs are promoting Tokyo Olympic Games or athletes. And we're, you know, in the limbo. And the government kind of played low key for COVID-19. The decision for a uh, cancellation of Tokyo Olympic Games should have made earlier. And also, you know, seeing all the global lockdowns elsewhere, 
and uh, Mr. Abe made uh, a national emergency declaration in early April. Uh, but it was rather late. You know, our perception was that this should have come much earlier. So that seems to, you know, from our eyes, the leadership have, was very hesitant to make decisions. And uh, looking at the uh, reactive uh, portion of uh, Japanese leadership that we had the first patient found in January 16th and no one was in charge uh, of the coronavirus response until March 6th when um, economic minister, Mr. Uh, Mr. Nishimura was appointed. And on March 13th, the emergency bill was passed, which is two months after the first patient was found. And when Abe officially uh, postponed the Tokyo Olympic Games on March 24, Japan was already in the next phase of its health crisis, where no longer possible to track down when and where patient had contracted the disease. Uh, you know, the successful strategy that Masakamoto-san talked about. By then, you know, those cluster-based strategies don't look effective. So at the peak of first wave, first wave, health facilities were filling up quickly and coming to a verge of collapse. You know, if Japan was hit by a much larger wave, it could have been disaster. Because Japan's intensive care unit, bed capacity is only half of Italy's. So if the Italian scale hit Japanese soil, then I don't know what uh, Japan would have responded. So before second wave hit, we had the moment to breathe. Japan could have addressed insufficient PCR testing capabilities, but it, it has kept the same strategy. So it made it difficult for Japan to grasp a complete picture of this pandemic. And from my view, uh, if you don't have a complete picture, how can you come up with the right solution to, to combat this uh, epidemic, uh, pandemic? And also, you know, Japan's relatively low uh, death toll in the first wave gave the admin, Abe administration a false sense of confidence. Even, you know, as mentioned, the government officials were saying successful Japan model. And because of the overconfidence, uh, Japan missed a chance to thinking of in depth about long term strategy, how to combat a pandemic and move on to the invisibleness of Japanese leadership. Um, bureaucratic sectionalism uh, were a major bottleneck and it was very difficult for them to form joint command. And this is not prone, this is, this is not prone to Japanese system, it exists everywhere, um, you know, but the case of Japan, the, the sectionalism remains very strong. So at a national crisis like this, I wish to see a nationwide old Japan effort get you know, various experts and uh, best and brightest from various fields to get together. However, reluctance and avoidance to tap into other jurisdictions, um, intra-agency coordination and cooperation did not materialize. Leadership was invisible. So, and also, if you remember uh, cruise ship Diamond Princess case, it has a lot of attention of, you know, from foreign media. The health ministry, Minister of Defense, infectious disease experts, uh, local authorities were there, but every agency acted its own. Uh, Minister of Defense uh, left in relatively early phase because they were not part of the command, <coughs> command chain. So the new uh, emergency law that passed uh, in uh, mid-March did not adequately um, address the problem. It neither provided the superseding emergency power over ministries and agency to overcome bureaucratic uh, stove piping, nor stated where the decision-making responsibility rested. And decision process is unclear. This is my next point. Well, we take up this uh, case of PCR testing kit. The health ministry uh, made National Institute for Infectious Disease as a sole designated PCR producer because it was under their you know, health ministry jurisdiction. And there was, you know, but, but they are the not most efficient uh, pr producer of the PCR and they were so slow. 
to address the chronic shortage of PCR testing kit. In mid-February, um, the authority could have turned to the private sector um, for help. And uh, there are many efficient uh, flu diagnosis device makers in Japan who would have responded to incentives uh, for quick and effective diagnosis kit productions. The hesitation to uh, give the antibody to private makers has resulted in a severe shortage of testing capacity across the country. In fact, uh, Rakuten, a private company, uh, introduced the easy PCR uh, kit in April 20th, but had to stop distribution 10 days after. I don't know exactly, exactly the reason, but it says maybe criticism from a Medical Doctors Association or some um, malprocedure, uh, you know, in filing the, um, you know, enterprises, but I don't know, but it was stopped. I was expecting to see more of those private, you know, companies entering those uh, PCR productions, but it suddenly didn't happen. Um, so another example is drive-through options of PCR. Um, the ministry, the health ministry, didn't allow drive-through testing until April 15th. Two months after, South Korea had launched its very successful testing campaign. Uh, we have seen it, you know, neighboring country and have two months. Uh, finally, Japan uh, allowed to have drive-through. It's a little late. And also because of a face-to-face -face, uh, visit should be limited for clinics. It is rational uh, to have uh, telemedicine available for any patient visit, but the health ministry and doctors association were very reluctant in making telemedicine widely available for patients for first visit. According to this statement, it is very special allowance and available for only crisis period only, and therefore, you know, it will be not allowed once COVID-19 crisis is over. Why? You know, this is a time, uh, you know, chance to, to explore new ways of health services. And this, even even you have, you know, crisis, but this is also a chance to, to you know, explore new ways, new innovations. So because, you know, unfortunate things in, in Japan is that the, the, because of these decisions were made in this such a way, that we're kind of losing the opportunity for policy innovations. And also uh, confusion over responsibility. Uh, this was witnessed between Abe administration and uh, prefecture governor uh, when Prime Minister Abe declared national emergency in early April. The responsibility of the government and prefecture were not so clear. Uh, it was up to uh, governors to conform to national emergency, but at the same time, the Abe administration was very hesitant to empower governors. Um, while most of governors were silent, uh, Tokyo Governor Koike Yuriko introduced her own initiative to contain uh, the virus, but her initiative generated friction among uh, and with the Abe administration over which types of businesses should be designated to for voluntary closure under uh, emergency order. Uh, Koike desired stricter measures, but Abe pushed her back and included a range of businesses to be remain open because she had no real power to enforce a closure to business owners and she was required to consult with the central government. Um, Koike had initially struggled to minimize the impact of the virus. And uh, another example is when ending the national emergency order uh, in mid-May, the government provided neither, uh, neither um, uh, clear conditions nor exit strategy. You know, frustrated with the uh, administration's laid-back stance and the rising number of bankruptcies, Osaka Governor Yoshimura uh, fearlessly um, announced Osaka's detailed own criteria, you know, to lift the, his business suspension request while a uh, national emergency order was still in place. So public opinion polls revealed a sharp contrast between the soaring popularity of Governor Yoshimura and the widespread frustration with the Abe administration. It is clear that Japanese people wanted decisive leaders. And final point is inconsistent policies. 
uh, protocol for securing safety was just lacking, you know, because Abe administration was aimed for, you know, maintain economic activities and try to limit infection as much as possible. So their priority was economic activity. But in order to assure economic activity, you need some kind of protocol, you know, how to secure safety while doing, you know, businesses. What I mean by that is that when you enter, when you fly to Tokyo and then you, you know, you land in Narita and then you immediately got it to a, a PCR testing booth and uh, you'll be, you know, you have to take a test and in a couple hours you, you wait and you get a result uh, these days because it has been, uh, the time has been reduced because they increase the capacity, including antibody tests. But if I wanted to go overseas to have a business trip, I have to find a private clinic to do PCR tests. They are not uh, offered in an airport. So therefore uh, I need to find myself and it's so uh, troublesome because, but it's not offered uh, so easily. And today many nations uh, require proof of PCR uh, result certified by doctors within 72 hours upon arrival. Uh, this is to allow business people to smoothly fly in and out the country to engage more business activities. You, know, you need PCR testing with doctor's certificate and when you have a business trip. And I, I looked for the clinic and then what I found out is that I have to pay 400 US dollars to take a PCR test and to get a doctor's certificate. It's too expensive. So therefore, I think in, in order to promote you know, economic activity, I think there are a lot of things that need to be done. And also a uh, go-to campaign, uh, Japanese government introduced this ca uh, campaign to help depressed tourist industry. Um, however, it hit just when the second wave was just coming. So it was very confusing message uh, to the public. And also the, the decision to exclude, exclude Tokyo came last minute. And so that making very um, economic impact uh, minimum uh, because uh, people from Tokyo in and out is one of the major uh, resources for the economic activities. So they're sending ex, you know, the mixed message and to sum up. So uh, this campaign was very unpopular among people. They said they should stop. So um, to sum up, if you think Japan uh, managed uh, well of the coronavirus curve, and then, but it was not a result of government policy, uh, we will have to wait for the scientific studies to find the real cause. But Japanese public is very diligently following uh, guidelines of social distance, wearing masks, hand washing, and that definitely contributed to the, to the low number of, uh, of death and cases. So the criticism and disappointment simply aimed to Abe administration as Japanese see the past government response was not sufficiently met with their expectations. Um, I think because I have time up. Um, so um, I have listed lessons, but maybe we can talk about one in the panel discussion time and I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, another thought-provoking talk uh, and has generated uh, a number of questions, both from me and, and our listeners. Uh, again, we will answer these at the end of the third talk, which we will move on to shortly. Uh, so our third speaker is Sota Kato, the Executive Director of the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research and professor at the International University of Japan. He has served as senior fellow at the Research Institute of Economy, Trade and Industry. Uh, Dr. Kato received his PhD in political science from the University of Michigan. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming virtually uh, for the audience. And let's get started with my presentation. And the, my, the title of my presentation is Why is Abe so unpopular? Uh, COVID-19 and Japanese politics. And uh, I added was, a parenthesis uh, was, because as um, Rakamisa mentioned that after Abe uh, stated resignation uh, two weeks ago, um, his uh, approval rate jumped up. So whether it is or was, uh, there's a puzzle. And I, I will look at some chart data uh, to see why this is puzzling question. 
and what was wrong with Abe. So, um, so this is a chart is the bar graph is the change of approval rate from February to May. I realized that I saw uh, Murakami-san's data and it, it's, it's, it was still like August. So there was some drop in US and UK, but this data is taking between February and May. And you see the blue, blue, bar, blue bar chart shows the change of approval rate. So most of the countries um, uh, increased in the leaders uh, increased their approval rates uh, substantially. And, but except for the one country in the far right, which is Japan. So this, this blue bar chart itself is very interesting for Japan. Why the only, only Japan has, uh, Japan's approval, uh, approval rate uh, decline. But if you also look at the death rate or the fertility rate, uh, this is the line chart show the fertility rate and Japan is uh, uh, on par with like Australia and South Korea but much smaller than other like European um, North American countries. So Japan seems to be doing well uh, if you look at the fertility rate but the approval rate, as for the approval rate of the reader, Japan is the only country uh, which declined uh, up to the main. So this is puzzling. And so another puzzle reason for, for this, uh, another reason for this question is puzzling is that uh, I added, uh, the line chart is same as the one before, but the, this blue bar graph shows that how uh, strong the government response was, how, um, how strong government uh, measures was to uh, restrict uh, people's private life. And this bar chart is taken from the da uh, data set index called Government Response String Stringency Index uh, created by Oxford University. And as you can see that Japan is the far right one and Japan is the least uh, least uh, restrictive. Japan's uh, COVID-19 response was the least dis dis restrictive compared to other countries. And uh, Japan also managed to suppress the death rate lower than most of the countries. So, so these two like, um, so the fertility rate is pretty low and also uh, Japan managed to uh, accomplish that with uh, relatively uh, restrictive uh, measures. So, so the less restrictive measure means that uh, it gives more freedom to the people and also it's more, uh, it's better for the economy, right? So Japan seems to be doing well in these two uh, data. And also as uh, others have mentioned, Japan is one of the most aged society in the world. So Japan should be more vulnerable than uh, other countries. And also the like, um, population density is pretty high, but uh, Japan has accomplished this low fertility and low infection rate. So why is, uh, so, so this is why I, I questioned at the beginning. So why are this uh, approval is pretty low, uh, very low um, and declining? And maybe the reason is because it's outside the COVID-19 response. So, uh, so there, is, there are some possible explanations unrelated to COVID-19. And first, it might be the political scandals. And there were a lot of political scandals for the Abe administration these like uh, a year or half a year. So uh, Morikake, Chamber of some viewing party, electoral fraud, prosecutor scandals. Uh, these are all uh, criticized for political favoritism. And also all of these are rooted in concentration of power to the prime minister's office. Um, because Abe held office for nearly eight years, it's a record for Japanese prime minister. Uh, the power was concentrated in prime minister's office and that kind of invited and that became the root cause of these scandals and those, these political favoritisms. And so there are a lot of scandals and it's sure that these scandals negatively affected Abe's approval rate. 
And also, as others have mentioned, uh, maybe it's not because of the government response or the uh, government response or the government leaders, but Japanese people's uh, self-control power is great. So that was the reason why Japan accomplished uh, low fertility rate. Or maybe there are like factors, genetic factors, uh, aging factors, cultural factors. So there are other possible reasons why Abe was Abe's approval rate is declining. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, because of this high visibility of COVID-19, government response still should have had substantial and significant effect on Abe's approval rate. And as if you go into in details of surveys, uh, if you look at the question of uh, asking the uh, respondent evaluation of COVID-19 response of the government, and it's highly correlated with its uh, approval rate. So, so uh, these non-COVID-19 response factors definitely affected its approval rate negatively, but there, uh, there should be some reasons for why, other reasons for why Abe's approval uh, it is stagnated. So we should ask for like political scientists. So and I raised two hypotheses that might explain this uh, approval rate after the COVID-19 uh, COVID outbreak. One is retrospect voting and another is rally down the drag effect. I will just read through these two. Uh, retrospect voting. Uh, voters evaluate government performance by focusing on simple performance metrics, uh, usually economic indicators such as disposal income or like a GDP growth or unemployment rate. And voters vote for the incumbent when those indicators improved, improved uh, while in office. And this just Spectrum voting uh, research is recently applied to uh, natural disaster management of government. So, uh, and it works better than economic voting. So, it should this retrospective voting should have, have have something to say on this COVID nineteen response as well. And another is rally down the flag effect and voters increase support for the country's government or political leaders during periods of national crisis. And this is repeatedly observed phenomenon in the past. And so these are the two um, possible hypotheses that can explain Abe's uh, approval rate. And so, so let's start with retrospect voting. So if retrospect voting works, and retrospect voting is result-oriented voters voting behavior uh, hypothesis. So if retrospective voting works, it should positively affect Abe's approval rate. Because if like indicators like uh, fertility rate, death rate, or the infection rate uh, remains favorable for Abe's uh, favorable for Japan, Abe's approval rates should uh, increase if retrospective voting works. So, so you, you can look at this uh, figure uh, uh, below. So if the death and the infection rate remains low, retrospective voting, if, if retrospective voting works, uh, the approval rate should increase. And as for the rally around the flag, rally around the flag effect, it might uh, affect the opposite way uh, with the retrospective voting. So, if this and infection rate are is, are high, uh, people uh, become um, more uh, people feel more sense of crisis, and that should increase the rally around the flag effect, and that should increase approval rate of uh, borders. So these two might work in the opposite directions. And if you look at the data at this, at, until this point, retrospective voting seems not working yet. Uh, so the typical counter example is Japan. Right? So the simple indicators like uh, death rate, infection rate, 
are favorable for, favorable for Japan, but borders are not uh, evaluating those uh, favorable indi indicators. And also contact examples, maybe the it Italy or France, they have uh, some serious uh, conditions, but the uh, approval rate is remaining pretty high. And more extreme, uh, more extreme example, maybe the New York Governor Cuomo at the local level, uh, the state of New York uh, suffered the most devastating uh, result from the, among the US states, but the Governor Cuomo's approval rate uh, surpassed 80 percent, which is 80, more than 80 percent. So uh, it's very unusual. So Richard Swift voting seems not working yet. I, I suspect it might work in the future, but I, it's not still working. And that means that rally around the flag effect seems to be buried to a certain extent. So the questions will be, the question, the initial question was that why are these uh, are so unpopular. And the question here should be that why retrospect voting which should favor Abe is not working and why Abe could not capture the rally around the flag effect. So let's examine that. And so this is a chart taken from uh, YouGov, which is um, Survey Institute, uh, the fear of catching COVID-19. And as you can see, Japan is much higher, Japan, Japanese, uh, fear much more than other countries. Well, Japanese citizens fear uh, COVID-19 much more than citizens of other countries, except South Korea. Uh, this is taken from G5, G7 countries, and also also Australia and South Korea. And uh, so, this is this uh, sen uh, Japanese sentiment is um, interesting, especially you, you factoring the low fertility rate. So Japanese. Uh, more uh, fear more than Italy or France, uh, where there are a lot of uh, the fertility rate was much higher, but uh, Japan fear more. And this kind of sentiment of Japanese citizens might have affected negatively for uh, Abe's approval rate, because uh, Abe's approach was modest, maybe indecisive, uh, but in some sense, in certain, in some sense, in, you can say it was reasonable. Be, uh, if you uh, account for the low fertility rate, uh, you, you can say it was reasonable, reasonable but uh, such a moderate uh, approach might, uh, the Japanese citizens who fear a lot about uh, COVID-19 might have not welcomed uh, Abe's moderate approach. He, they would, might have welcomed more uh, stringent uh, response. Uh, you can see from this chart. And also, um, you have to, um, voters, if you want to, if the political leaders were to uh, earn voters support from the rally effect or the retrospective body, voting, they have, voters need to recognize who was responsible for these um, uh, measures. And, and they, the leaders need to show that he's the one who should get the credit. And in the case of COVID-19, political leaders of local governments have been very active and visible in many countries, including Japan. So, like Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike and Osaka Governor Akihiro Yoshimura have appeared on national TV almost every day, and more, maybe more than other, since the outbreak of COVID-19. So if the public recognizes that local leaders are holding the flag, they will be the beneficiaries of the rally effect, not Abe, but they will be the beneficiaries. And if you look at the surveys, results of surveys, I, I, uh, people, respondents generally support uh, local government leaders more than Abe, and also they trust more uh, local government leaders more than Abe. So the, maybe the, battle for the flags or battle for the credibility, credibility was won by local leaders and not by national leader Abe. And that might be one of the reasons why Abe's uh, approval rate is stagnating. 
So these pictures, the left hand is Abe and uh, Koike and uh, Yoshimura, and these three pictures kind of show the attitude, typically show the attitude. Abe is relaxing. This picture was uh, provided in Abe's Twitter account. Uh, Abe is relaxing in his house, uh, drinking coffee. But other two governors, Tokyo Governor Koike and uh, Osaka Governor Yoshimura, uh, they are. Uh, they, are, they, are, they have stern rocks and they are always cautioning uh, uh, citizens. And so these are the uh, upper, uh, ad different attitudes of these three leaders. And uh, I, I kind of suspect that uh, attitudes of Koike and um, Yoshimura have taken more, uh, was taken more favorably compared to Abe uh, because Japanese uh, citizens fear a lot about the COVID-19. I'll just skip up to the US case. So just to wrap up, why Abe is so un unpopular? Uh, so one, the first season, retrospective voting, which should have favored Abe, is not yet working. I say not yet working. I, I suspect it will start working in the future. Uh, and this is not only in Japan. And also Abe failed to capture rally down the flag effect, which seems to be working in several countries. Uh, low, maybe low infection and fatality rates might have been preventing him from taking stronger measures and that kind of uh, led Abe to fail to capture rally down the flag effect. And also Abe might have lost the battle for the flag with governors. Um, and that might be one of the reasons. And also there are a lot of non-governmental reasons like political scandals. And I still think one can still argue that Abe has done relatively well against the COVID-19. And his modest and gradual approach might have minimized socioeconomic damage while making the low infection in this state. And also he might be, uh, he might have been uh, positively uh, evaluated by the borders uh, if the retrospect voting stopped working, but since he designed, he cannot test that. Uh, and, but, uh, I, but in the, in my, the conclusion, it's not, I think it's not re reached yet. So that's the end of my presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kato-san, for a, a lovely presentation on those political aspects of the uh, COVID outbreak in Japan. Uh, so now we've come to the end of our three talks and uh, finished exactly on one hour. Uh, well done to our three speakers, perfect timing. And we have got a number of questions from our audience. I am going to just open it up and perhaps uh, maybe to uh, uh, any of our panelists, but uh, maybe uh, Sakamoto-san, if I may ask, uh, with the elderly, you said the elderly have been protected in nursing homes. Uh, could you please tell us a bit more about how that's being achieved? And a, a comment, uh, just something I've read before, uh, in, in Japan, they talk about lonely deaths, where there are 5 million elderly people who live alone, and I think 40,000 of them have sort of died alone, and they think that'll be about 100,000 by the end of the decade. Now, although it's obviously a horrible thing from a social point of view, from a COVID point of view, it's probably protecting them protecting those 5 million people from COVID. So do you mind just commenting on, on that and just how the elderly have been protected? Because as you know, in Australia, in Victoria, we've had uh, a big problem with deaths arising from residential aged care facilities getting uh, a wash with COVID cases. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the question. So the how to protect an older, older population. My point is that how to protect an older population at the nursing facilities, not at home. So the uh, compare with the case in the, some European countries, more than half of deaths are occurred in nursing facilities in some countries. However, in Japan, very fewer died in the nursing facilities due to the COVID-19. I think this is because the frontline workers, like the caregivers, made the uh, effort to prevent the uh, elderly people are getting infected. So, for example, the, some facilities close the uh, family or friends are visiting the nursing facilities in the very early stage of the COVID-19 pandemic, like the very early February or end of the even 
end of the January, or the uh, uh, healthcare workers working at nursing home themselves and try to be uh, not infected, like you know, wearing the masks correctly, or always washing the hand and personal hygiene, and do not going out, or they do not do this kind of the high risk activities. So I think the urges and the personal effort contributing a lot to our calling the class of happening in a nursing home. However, as you mentioned, from the uh, social aspect, the protecting the elderly is sometimes, sometimes very controversial. So, of course, we need to protect the older people, but at the same time, we need to how we can uh, secure the opportunity that these older people are still making a connection with the family members and the friends or as a part of the social activities. However, there's a no a good answer for this question because the uh, people are very struggling how to keep the social activities while protecting older people from the COVID-19. So some day or the nursing facilities introduce an ICT device like an iPad or mobile phone or mobile tablet in order to keep communicating with the family members. But majority of the older people are not really familiar with this kind of the ICT device. So the uh, and that person, I think the ICT device does not really replace the real contact with the family members and the friends. So like the uh, how we can uh, keep the uh, social activity and social connection with the family members and friends while protecting the older people from the COVID-19 is still a very big issue. However, when the seeing the uh, national debate about the uh, national debate, I think the are uh, are the, there's a not much debate is not happening this kind of the issues. So now the more focus is only to go to how protect the older people from the COVID-19 and then doesn't really care about the social aspect. So I think this is in the current situation in Japan. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we've, by the way, we have got a lot of time for questions. So uh, don't, don't be worried. We've, uh, we've got plenty of time to go through. I think we've got uh, more than 10 questions, 10 to 15 questions from our audience. Uh, the first one, I'm going to read out names because I think if this was a real live session, the person would come to the microphone and say their name and their affiliation. So uh, Kim Hale has said, uh, hi panelists. She's asking about the Japanese attitude to working from home which I guess we're seeing a lot in Australia and in a lot of Western countries. Was this uh, a difficulty in transition? And does Japan envision any opportunity for foreigners to be able to work remotely to assist Japanese organizations and businesses? Um, whoever would like to answer that from our panel, please go ahead. Well, can I ask, is, it, is do a lot of people work from home in Japan at the moment? Hi. Okay, yeah, uh, so the, this is you know, my personal view that I think the, uh, it depends on the generation. So like the younger generation, like in the 20s and 30s, because they are very familiar with the uh, working remotely by using the mobile phone and a PC and other this devices. So like the younger generation are very uh, positive for the working remotely. However, in the older generation or senior management class, I think this is just my personal impression, but I think these older senior generations are not really uh, positive for the working remotely. So the ones the are uh, state of emergency lifted, I think the uh, especially for the big companies where the uh, senior class is in the fifties and more than sixties, uh, they encourage the uh, their employees and come to the office physically. This is my view. Sure, thank you. Uh, then we have a question from Carol Lawson, who asks, can you comment on the role of shame and stigma in Japan in infectious diseases management, both historically and in the COVID era? Uh, this has been seen in medical facilities refusing to admit COVID patients, medical staff resigning under family pressure in order to avoid treating COVID patients, Children and spouses of known recovered COVID patients being excluded from school and workplaces, uh, patients avoiding diagnosis and treatment, uh, etc. And that that is true. I think uh, in every country in the world there is a different cultural approach and understanding and acceptance of disease. How has COVID nineteen been uh, reflected on in Japan? Mm. 
Hi, okay, so I, again, uh, so I think this is a very huge issue in Japan, both among for the healthcare professional and then also among the general public. So for the uh, healthcare professional, they sometimes refuse to take the bus, taxi or public transportation because they are recognized as the source of infections. And then the uh, kids of the healthcare workers sometimes refuse to come to the nursery or elementary school. So because of the stigma or fear of the COVID-19. And then among the general public as well, because the, uh, here in Japan, uh, we have a very strong pressure each other. So like the, uh, as in my presentation, I mentioned that we did not introduce the lockdown measures. Instead, the government encouraged people to stay at home and working remotely. And then the reason of success is that, I, one of the reasons of this success is that we have a very strong pressure among the each other. So the, during the uh, state of emergency, if the people are working around or going far places, there's a kind of a very negative pressure from the, uh, their, their neighbors. So the, uh, especially for the remote areas in Japan, the, where the number of infected is in the very low, if the, uh, someone or the family are, are diagnosed as COVID-19 positive, they have the experience, the uh, stigmatization or prejudice or this kind of a negative experience. And then the uh, government also showed the concern of this situation. And then the uh, several weeks ago, government established an expert committee on these issues and then the how to tackle the uh, prejudice and then this kind of the, uh, yeah, uh, these issues. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, and now there's one, I think, for uh, Murakami-san, uh, a comment regarding that, I think it was in your talk, you talked about the increase in uh, Prime Minister Abe's approval rating since he announced his retirement. I think you, you mentioned that, didn't you? Uh, the comment is, perhaps it's a case of better the devil you know. And this is from Louise Sweeney, I should say, the comment. And now the Japanese people are uncertain about his successor's ability to deal with COVID and the economic crises. So that's Louise's uh, comment. Uh, I mean, I, I also, when you mentioned that, I, I always find that once, he hasn't retired yet, but once a politician retires and they're out of the public eye, everyone forgets why they were angry with him or her and they look at them more fondly. Maybe that's what we're starting to see with Mr. Abe. Uh, Murakami-san, would you like to comment? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really a little bit uh, um, un, not understandable of the the, the devil uh, phrase, but does it mean that? Um, it's it's uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's it's uh, what it's really saying. Better the devil you know means that someone, no matter how bad they are, at least you know them. Whereas the next person you don't know, so they could even be worse. Ah, okay. So, but uh, at the current situation, I think uh, uh, Kato-san may have a much better idea, but the current situation is that we almost know who is going to succeed, Mr. Abe, and he said he's continuing Abe's policy, including COVID-19. So what I think, uh, and then I think that the rate uh, went up 20 points, uh, meaning that I think a public would satisfied with the continuation of our policy, even though you know I, I said many things uh, that uh, are frustrated, but I think as you said, you know people forget. You know, okay, he's quitting because he's ill, so that I feel sorry for him, right? Uh, he did great job. If you look at the eight years, you know, just COVID COVID nineteen is only past eight months, but the rest of if you look at the rest of his his term, maybe he did a great thing just to accept this COVID nineteen. So. <laughs> Um, for I think public general public, it's just uh, the way that they think that continuation is much more likely, and they like to see new faces. And uh, for that reason, I think even uh, we don't know who, what kind of policy the next successor is going to take, but generally know the same as the current situation. So therefore, I think people are not really looking for a big change, but maybe a continuation of the, the current status. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Kato-san, do you have anything to add to that or? <laughs> this is puzzling, but um, I think one is that uh, the news conference uh, he, when he announced the resignation was uh, taken very favorably by the uh, favorably of by Japanese citizens. 
Uh, and I, I, I also uh, watched that, and uh, he answered each question very sincerely and uh, uh, took a long time to answer each question. And I think that was accepted very favorably. And also, I think that uh, Japanese uh, citizens are thanking him for uh, doing a pretty good job in eight years in total. So uh, that's my guess, but I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, B. E. Laloa asks or notes that in Australia, a growing issue is confusion between the states and the federal government for key responsibilities. Which responsibilities do you think are currently ineffectively allocated between prefectural governments and federal governments in Japan? And uh, yes, that's a big issue here in Australia where uh, particularly over borders, uh, which, which states, should states have the ability to close political borders? I think it's frustrating the federal government at the moment because they want to open up the country, the, the economy, et cetera. And it really has uh, brought up the issue of what should states control? What should uh, the federal government control? So here in Australia, um, the economy, defense, the federal government looks after, but the states look after health uh, primarily and a number of other things. And a former premier of one of the states was just saying of the public servants in Australia, 78% of them are state public servants. They're not federal. So he was arguing that the states should have more power because they've got more people on the ground. But uh, Obviously, you've talked, you've touched on the issues between the prefectural governors in Japan and the prime minister. Uh, what, what is your comment on this? Is it me? Oh, um, it can be anyone. Uh, I think I should I respond first? Yeah, cut us on, please. Yeah, I think yeah. this the COVID-19 uh, issue has spotlighted this fundamental issue of division of uh, tasks between national and local government. And um, I think, I, I, I'm not sure about other countries, but in Japan, I think that borders or the citizens realize that local government has much to do in this situation, but they don't have the uh, enough, this, uh, enough uh, right to do that. And so, um, Borders kind of attributed attributed the responsibility to local government. That's my take on this like thing. But uh, the decision power uh, is not delegated enough to the local government. That and this should be discussed more in the future and uh, this has, this is a really fundamental question and uh, this course COVID-19 has spotlighted this and uh, this should be discussed further. Can I add one uh, comment in addition to Mr. Katos? Um, also the Japanese case is that uh, uh, we don't have state tax, it's, it's all federal taxed. So therefore the, the prefectures are getting money from the central government. So this is the like, hierarchical situation. So therefore sometimes that will limit, limit you know, governors or it gives a lack of budget. They can't really have a say and they have to obey what the federal government says. So, you know, there are a lot of discussion that the state tax should be allowed or, you know, what decentralization uh, should be promoted and but still that uh, federal government has not given up the taxation uh, policy toward the local government. So that's one of the main issues. Okay. And uh, I was going to ask a question, but uh, Shiri has asked a question which leads on to the question I was going to ask. Which are the most affected areas in Japan? Is it a fairly uniform level of infection throughout Japan, or have some areas been more affected than others? We kind of charted graph, uh, taking the relationship between population density and uh, uh, death rate, and there's very, very clear uh, proportional relations. So the areas that were affected most were the uh, areas with population, high population density, which means like Tokyo, Osaka, and um, 
Nagoya in those, those uh, prefectures. Has any uh, local governor or local political leader, as in Australia, tried to close their prefecture or their, their area from areas with high levels of disease, if they've had low levels of disease, or do they not have that power? They don't, mostly they don't have like um, formal power, but they try to kind of do, do, do those kind of things. And they, yes, and yes. Okay, okay. And so is that, is there a particular area which has been closed down for a long time to people from outside the area or they haven't been able to sustain that? It's not re legal. They could not close the shut down the border of prefecture legally, but they the governors asked people to not come in or come in. So that kind of informal uh, restriction were made. Okay. Uh, can I add one point? Of course. Okay. Uh, I think there are there's a no uh, official. I mean official limitation for the geographical area, but instead are uh, the are uh, there's a kind of the uh, high risk place like nightclub on the bars. So the uh, Boston Prime Minister and the Cabinet Secretary and also the Metropolitan Governor are uh, encouraging people to do not go to this kind of high risk areas, not in geographical areas, but in the encourage people to not to go to the uh, bars and the club or night, night pub, or this kind of the areas. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Uh, Declan O'Hare has written quite a long question. So Declan, I hope you don't mind if I paraphrase it. Uh, I think essentially Declan is asking, says that China's response to the uh, to COVID hasn't been ideal. Should has COVID nineteen affected Japan's relationship to with China? So maybe Murakami-san or Kato-san, would you be in a position to answer that? So if I understand the question correctly, so COVID-19 situation affected the Japan-China relations? Yes, in any way. Okay. In the same um, way, I guess it has in the United States, they're trying to distance themselves from China and blame, etc. cetera. Uh, okay. Um, a Japanese leader, especially Abe, was very um, conscious about, you know, not damaging relation with China. So that's why he waited last minute. He didn't uh, close down from entry from Chinese, uh, tur uh, China uh, tourists. He only, uh, Japan only limited particular provinces, not like entire China, like US did. So very carefully, um, you know, limiting particular areas and because he wanted to see the success of Xi Jinping and, and the uh, you know, summit. <clears throat> and also, uh, Japan is really closely related to, uh, uh, you know, Chinese, I mean, economic activities in Chinese market. So therefore, as Japan's position, you don't want to miss, miss, you know, relation with China. So that kind of portrayed as much. And then therefore, um, especially when U.S. and China is having really, uh, you know, harsh uh, relations. So therefore, Japan as a, like a more Christian, we want to kind of, you know, elevate yourself to be a good friend of China. So uh, Japan is trying to be, you know, much more friendly basis with China, not damaging any Japan-China relationship. That's, that's what I see. So, so if anything, the relations, the strength of the relationship has increased through COVID. Uh, um, maybe neutral though. Um, there are many, uh, you know, like schools or uh, some uh, factories sent masks to, you know, the children. So they're like at the like local level. So Japan sent like masks to the particular province and then the province also sent back masks to the schools in Tokyo. So it's sort of um, a more of a grassroots uh, relations, but they try to be more helpful to each other. And that's why I, I don't see any confrontation. Uh, you know, on, in terms of, of uh, and limiting Chinese, don't come Chinese. We don't have that sort of thing, um, evidently, you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask uh, is the, the implications of canceling the Olympic Games, because 
I think we all know, I mean, having had it in 2000 here, we know it was such a big deal, so much money, so much time invested in trying to win the Olympics competition. There's so much prestige for the country, for the political leader, it's, uh, it's win, win, win. And then having to cancel it must have been devastating. I guess, did, do the people, did the people at the time accept that it had to be done or was that regarded as a failure of Japan's response to COVID uh, and how are they dealing with it now? Um, I think uh, the situation is pretty obvious. Um, they thought they could handle at the very beginning because you know in Japan that the, the patient the number was not so high. But if you look at China, it's rising all the number of patients and also European you know nations. So even Japan is able to keep itself as a, you know the better uh, environment. But all the rest of the world, uh, people coming from you know the various places. So. It's the question of can you do, you know, within this situation where a lot of, you know, the COVID-19 is also, so you can't really have just own, you know, your own country, but how do you deal with when did the rest of the world, uh, people coming to Japan and can you deal with it? Can you deal with the safety? And it was pretty obvious that it's, it's not maybe a possible. So it, it, people feel like it's, well, you know, you can't help it uh, if, you know, it's not the failure of Japanese policy, but it's more of the, the, the overall situation developing elsewhere and worldwide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now, uh, someone labeled as Stevenson asks, and this may be one for Sakamoto-san, uh, could you tell us more about in-car testing for COVID in Japan? What extent is it being used? My understanding is that it's not comprehensive, so introduced independently by prefectures or cities and only covers very small numbers of, pay, of people. I think the testing center in Nagoya, which was opened in May, only took about 15 people a day, two days a week. This is different mm -hmm. to other countries such as the US, Australia, and South Korea. Okay, yeah, thank you for the question. So like the, uh, after the uh, 2009 novel influenza pandemic, the uh, expert committee recommended to uh, have the capacity to doing the car testing, uh, car PCR testing. And then the uh, staff at the local government, most of the old local government have an experience of training when conducting the uh, car PCR testing. Uh, however, uh, in my presentation, because of the, uh, in the initial phase, the local public health center uh, overwhelmed by the uh, response for the COVID-19 case. So the, it took a time to set up the car PCR testing. However, the, in some municipalities and the local government started doing the PCR testing. However, the government uh, does, not, does, not, does not recommend a nationwide car PCR testing like the uh, South Korea or Germany. So it doesn't car PCR testing, but here in Japan, the government does not recommend the uh, nationwide car PCR testing. And then the uh, main reason is that it's related to the previous question that, uh, about the relationship between the central government and local government. But the uh, situation of the COVID-19 is very different among the prefectures. So for example, like in the Tokyo metropolitan areas, the number of the positive cases are totally different from the Tokyo and the other areas. So like the uh, government, Say so it does not uh, recommend any nationwide testing testing policy. So the uh, it totally depends on the local government. So the local government decide that it is very useful to introduce the car PCR testing. In that case, some local government does. Okay, thank you. And I guess uh, talking about the testing, do you, I do you agree with this approach to just testing for clusters, or do you mm -hmm. think testing should be performed a bit more widely? I think they are a bit more widely because in the only uh, cluster approach, we cannot avoid the state of emergency. And then we experienced that our surge increase in the end of the March to the early April. So we need to expand to the PCR testing capacity, not only for the cluster approach. However, uh, I do not agree with the uh, mass screening for the asymptomatic cases. Instead, like in the early July, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government decided to contact the PCR testing for the those who are working in the nightclub and the bars because they are very high risk of the infected. So like the, I think they are focused on the target group with the high risk population, like the someone who are working in healthcare facility or nursing home, or it's those who are working in the nightclub and the bar, 
nightclub and the bars. I think this kind of the places, I think we need to expand the PCR testing capacity. But for example, in some prefectures, we does not experience in any positive COVID-19 positive case recently. So like, I do not really agree with the conduct this kind of the areas where the uh, very few positive case, positive COVID-19 case, and then the very few, yeah, in that kind of the, uh, uh, pre probability is not very low in that kind of places. So I do not agree to expand the PCR testing capacity for those who are symptomatic cases. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, and a question from Christian Magnus uh, Hauken. I hope I've pronounced that properly. A question for uh, Katosan. You, you mentioned that the higher sense of fear among the Japanese population is a reason for the decreasing support for Abe during the COVID-19 pandemic. There is some indication in research that fear responses in voters generally favors the right or the conservative political spectrum. What would set the fear factor in Japan apart, apart from that in Britain, Australia, US? In short, why hasn't the fear factor helped the LDP or Abe? Okay. Um, I yes, I think it's generally true that this kind of fear, kind of sentiment, uh, work positively for right hand right hand conservatives. Uh, but as I showed uh, audience in the PowerPoint, uh, the pictures of Abe and two governors. Abe's approach toward COVID-19 was uh, kind of moderate and just asking people to be relaxed and, and those kind of approaches. And other like governors um, were more, uh, took more stronger position and uh, more uh, called for more Restrict, restrictive measures. So in this case, in this particular case, because Abe's approach was moderate, uh, the Japanese uh, citizens fear sentiment uh, negatively affected Abe's approval rate. But yes, it's true that uh, uh, fear kind of sentiment will usually uh, support uh, right-hand side uh, politicians. And uh, Abe is uh, definitely right-hand side politicians in Japan. Thank you for that. And just, just to follow on, in fact, from uh, Murakami-san's uh, talk, I think when you first showed the approval of uh, for Prime Minister Abe from the different parties, you had the bar graph. Even the LDP, 43% still disapproved, which was uh, which surprised me actually. That's his own party, even though it was better than the other parties. So anyway, uh, so I have a question from. Ari Sharp, I guess for any of our panelists. Ari says, uh, join, I'm joining here in a personal capacity. My question, Japan was already struggling to achieve a female workforce participation. What does COVID-19 and the caring responsibilities for children and the elderly that disproportionately impact women mean for women at work? Okay, maybe I, I start. Um, um, at the same survey that I looked at NHK, that they have shown, you know, how much your salary, how much is your income is affected. That question, like 70% is unaffected. So like 30% affected. And then if you look at women's um, uh, pattern of uh, workforce, they are mostly uh, non-regular non-regular workers so who happen to be suffering much more than regular workers and then the proportion of the women is much much higher maybe majority of these non-regular workers are occupied by all women so i think uh, those women have very difficult time these days uh, with this COVID 19 situation because they are laid off or their uh, contract stopped and but uh, I think government has still lacking to kind of uh, get a sufficient help of those people. And so they have to catch up. But I think women at work has very difficult time, especially those who uh, are, are engaged in this non-regular, as a non-regular workers. Thank you. And I think even here in Australia, the uh, figures I saw on a news program were suggesting that women were also disproportionately affected when it came to 
COVID and work. So the consequences of that. Uh, now we have a question from uh, B.E. Loloa. How has the Japanese government approached informing migrant worker groups and enclaves, so Brazilians and Filipinos, uh, where's my question gone, uh, about COVID-19? Are the federal government, governments involved in informing these groups in any way, or is this delegated to municipal and prefectural governments? Uh, so I guess that we can also think about Singapore where their big, I guess, second wave or second surge was associated with migrant workers, uh, which I think they finally got under control, but they're still dealing with. Uh, how is, is, are there a lot of uh, migrant worker groups, uh, Brazilians, Philippines, et cetera, in Japan? And how have they been educated uh, about COVID and looked after with regard to COVID? Maybe Sakamoto-san, would you have any thoughts on that or? I, okay, uh, thank you for the question. Actually, I do not have that much knowledge about the migrant workers, uh, but I think there are some nursing care facilities and started to accept the migrant workers, mainly from the uh, Asian countries. And then because they cannot come to the Japan because of the COVID-19, uh, some nursing care facilities might have the severely affected the short shortage of the long-term care workers. And then the, even the ordinary time, because of the rapid increase in the population or the population, uh, we are suffering from the chronic shortage of the long-term uh, care workers who are working at the nursing home. So the, uh, because of the COVID-19 and then the migrant worker cannot come to the Japan, or uh, this nursing home should have been severely affected in these areas. And then the, also the rural areas, some fisheries and agricultures, they are also deeply rely on the migrant workers. Uh, and then the, again, the, uh, this uh, industry is also affected uh, because of the shortage of the migrant workers. Thank you. Would our other two panelists like to comment? Uh, um, I, I also don't have much uh, knowledge about this, but just to want to uh, um, a couple points that uh, uh, to start with the Japanese in, in Japanese working environment, not so many mig uh, foreign migrant uh, migrant uh, labor force. And Japan has been really uh, minimum of, of accepting those uh, immigrant labor. So, but uh, on the last, uh, you know, not only this COVID-19, but last disasters and natural disasters, we see a problem that communication has been only in Japanese, news broadcasting and or you know, mainly in Japanese so that those people are left out from, you know, information, necessary information. So I think it's still that the issue remains. So therefore, not only the federal government, but also the local uh, communities or local government has to deal with those things, but still a shortage of, of um, having providing such uh, uh, services to uh, non-Japanese uh, uh, workers. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, also, a question from me, maybe for Sakamoto-san, for is Japan aiming to eliminate or control slash suppress this, this virus. So we're yeah. having this debate endlessly in Australia and New Zealand, a country like New Zealand's gone for elimination, was largely successful until it had a recent outbreak. What is Japan's approach? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a very important question. So I think the uh, initial stage, I think government tried to eliminate the virus. Uh, virus. That was the government strategy, I understand. But however, the uh, after the uh, state of emergency lifted in the end of the May, but we still have the uh, several hundred daily case in Japan, which means the government uh, give up to eliminate the virus. Instead, the now I think government shifted the policy uh, from the elimination to the control of the virus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the initial stage government tried to eliminate because they are uh, as the some of the Asian countries and try to eliminate and then in order to con uh, I mean considering the relationship between the neighboring countries I mean the business trip or traveling or also the Olympic game uh, in the next year I think government tried to eliminate in the initial stage but I think the uh, they are uh, shifted their policy not to eliminate but to I, I mean co coexist with the virus. I think it is very difficult to eliminate mm. the virus. Mm. It is it is very hard. And if you do yeah. it, there's always the risk it can come back. 
Yeah, and then I think the, uh, there's a huge debate between the uh, public health expert and then also the economic expert. And then because the, uh, I think the public health expert insisted that we should eliminate the virus first. And then after once we succeed in eliminating the virus, we can do more actively uh, reopening the economic activity and other social activities. But during the state of the emergency, there's a huge debate between the public health and the economies. And then economy side has a stronger voice than the public health. And then they say, are uh, they Japan should reopen the uh, social activity and economic activities and then the other uh, decided to support the voice for the economic side which means the uh, government shifted from the con elimination to the uh, coexist okay and uh, with with this surge that we're seeing in Japan are there a lot of people being hospitalized or are they mainly in the community uh, I think the initial stage and uh, most of the people, even they are mild symptom or asymptomatic case, they are uh, hospitalized. But the after several months, because then there is an, I mean, uh, asymptomatic case and the mild case is in the burden to the healthcare system. So the government and the local government both stay safe in the policy. So they encourage these people to stay at home or stay at hotel or other isolation facilities. So now only severe case or those who are at high risk, like the elderly or those who are in underlying condition, only those people are hospitalized. And uh, anonymous attendee asks, in Australia, the federal government has discussed the idea of a travel bubble that would include Australia and New Zealand. So that would mean free travel between two areas with low levels of COVID. So anonymous attendee is asking, would Japan seek to join this tra travel bubble if such an idea is consented and endorsed? And maybe I guess answer that, not necessarily our travel bubble, but is there a, a more, uh, another regional travel bubble that Japan is looking at joining? Maybe I start, uh, you know, having, you know, stay home for several months, I think people are really wanted to go travel. And, you know, having Australia, New Zealand is a closer <laughs> compared to other, you know, going to Europe or other places. So I really wish that Japan would join this uh, travel bubble uh, because, uh, you know, once you have set a protocol, you know, the safety and assurance of a law, you know, you have a, a certificate or whatever, you know, to make, uh, make it available for people to, to easily travel, that would be very uh, preferable. And I hope that would happen soon. And so that I really like to join that <laughs> personally. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think we're all getting a bit stir crazy, not being able to move very far from our homes. So that, that, that would be nice. Uh, now, oh, the uh, Sakamoto-san, you mentioned Coco, the app. Has there been, good uptake or has there been suspicion and issues with privacy etc i think the uh, this is a good first step because the uh, we are i mean the before the cocoa has been introduced the uh, local public health center are uh, making the phone call individually and then the uh, sharing the information using the fax I think fax, not the email or digital device, but they're using the fax. So after introducing the uh, COCOA, uh, and now I think it is a good timing for the Japan to shift from the, kind, how to say, uh, kind of the old, old, old skill like the fax or telephone or this kind of old skill to the digitalization. Of course, there's many challenges about introducing the COCOA application. And then there's some of the concern and the criticism isn't coming up. But I think as an initial step, I think this isn't a good first step. Okay, thank you. Uh, look, uh, hopefully uh, there have been a few questions, but I think we've, a uh, few more questions, but I think we've covered everything uh, largely. I just wanted to finish on the state of emergency. I got the impression, even though it was called a state of emergency, not many things were enforced by the government. Is that right? It was more just in name only? Is that Yeah, correct? yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. But because of this high fear level that uh, I think Karazan mentioned in his, his talk, uh, people listened. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Look, it's, it's 6.56. Uh, I think we've, we've covered a lot, both within the talks, the three great talks by our three wonderful speakers who've uh, taken time out of their uh, valuable days to, uh, to inform us about COVID-19 in Japan and the, the politics around it. 
So uh, without further ado, I would like to thank everyone who's attended and stayed to listen to the questions. I thought that there were a number of really good questions from the audience that our panelists answered really well. So hopefully this will set the tone for tomorrow's session on the economy. Uh, but for now, I would like to thank our, our three speakers uh, and all of you uh, for attending this session. Thank you.